hated public speaking. When I would go to the grocery store, I found it so hard to find treats. Would you say that it was the right choice of not taking forward your dream of becoming a doctor? I am so lucky that I absolutely love what we're doing. If we're still putting artificial flavors and colors and stabilizers in frozen treats, why not try to make something healthier? Welcome back to another episode of The Edge, a leader's show. I am Pragya Bisain, and a question for our viewers. What comes first to your mind when I say all natural, gluten-free and vegan? Well, there might be many things, but definitely not a popsicle. On today's episode, we are sitting with someone who's creating all healthy ingredients and low-calorie frozen treats for Canadians and already becoming a household popular name in Toronto. Please welcome Raginson alumni and the founder of Happy Pops, Leila Keshavji. Thank you for having me. Of course. So you completed your degree in kinesiology from the University of Toronto. How did you come up with Happy Pops right after that? Yeah, so while I was studying kinesiology in one of my nutrition courses, one of the things I was learning about is the ingredients in the food we're eating. And after doing three and a half years of school, when I would go to the grocery store, I found it so hard to find treats that met the criteria of what I was looking for. So they would say vegan or gluten-free on the back, but when I would turn it over, it would still have all kinds of sugar, high fructose corn syrup, artificial colors, flavors, and all these stabilizers. And I was like, wow, if I'm having a hard time deciphering what's good for you, how are other people doing it? And as someone who loves frozen treats, I thought if we're still putting artificial flavors and colors and stabilizers in frozen treats, why not try to make something healthier? So just the health point of view was the inspiration behind making it vegan and gluten-free or it was just the market demand at that time? Well, I think because we're using real fruit, it's naturally vegan and gluten-free in that sense because it, we're using fruit, water, mm -hmm. and basically organic cane sugar. Mm -hmm. But the idea was to make a better for you treat. So when we started, we were doing strawberry, mango, guava, passion fruit, a lot of tropical flavors. Then we started expanding based on what our customers were asking for. And then we started taking nostalgic classics, like a, fudge, like a chocolate fudge pop, but making it better for you. So instead of using dairy, cream, a whole lot of sugar, we would do oat milk, sustainable cocoa, and a little bit of organic cane sugar. So it was a healthier take yeah. on these nostalgic classics that we all grew up eating. So is that what would you say that makes you different from the other brands in the similar niche? Yeah, I would say there's a couple things. I would say definitely our ingredient list. When you, when you look at it, there's ingredients you can recognize. And that was a big thing. So our strawberry popsicles, strawberry water, organic cane sugar, and lemon juice. And then the other thing we've tried to do is our packaging. Make it really fun and colorful, like what you would traditionally see in the space, but also elevated because we've crafted Happy Pops for families. We didn't want this to just be a kid's treat. We wanted this something that you could bring home, kids could have with their grandparents and their parents, and there was a flavor for everyone, and you still felt like it was this nice, cool treat. Yeah, and I think it's low calorie, which is like, like you mentioned, it could be used by anybody, not just kids and just adults. It can be used by athletes as well. So I'm just curious, did it take you too long to just perfect the taste without using any artificial sugar and organic ingredients, or was that the easy part? Yeah, I would say that's pretty easy. I mean, growing up in the food industry, I think I've been very lucky to attend a lot of different trade shows and see both the health side of it and the really delicious side because we would go to a variety of trade shows with, with my family. And one of the things I really wanted to be is I wanted to be like healthy and tasty. Mm -hmm. so, that, so from the moment we started recipe testing, that was definitely the goal. And we never even tried to use any artificial flavors or colors. We would work with the real fruit, add a little bit of sh sugar, maybe some lemon juice to balance things out. And we stayed true to that seven and a half years later, mm -hmm. keeping the same ingredients, high quality, and really making that a really important part of our product. It's amazing, it's an amazing product. So I'm sure our viewers also want to know about your Dragon's Den experience and how did you prepare for it? Did somebody recommend it to you or did you have it in mind all the time? <laughs> I feel like Dragon's Den is a Canadian entrepreneur thing to do. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's watched Dragon's Den since I was 16, it was definitely on my list of things. Okay. But I hated public speaking. <laughs> like, it was really something I struggled with and I was not comfortable 
putting the business out there and, you know, potentially the outcome that could happen from something like that. But I was encouraged to do it. I saw a few friends had done it. So I showed up at CBC, auditioned and, you know, went through the process and very lucky to have had the opportunity to make it on the show and have the episode air. And yeah. it's hard to believe it was five years ago. So yeah. a lot has happened in that time. Yeah. Considering that it was before the pandemic, you started before the pandemic, but then the pandemic happened. Happy Pops was such a big hit in carnivals and wedding caterings and exhibitions. So how did that affect your business and how did you get over that? Yeah, it was one of, it was one of the toughest things because I feel like we were finally figuring a few things out. You know, we had launched into schools, our catering business had grown, also just recently launched into Sobeys, into the local program. And all of a sudden you couldn't visit stores. We had, we were sitting on inventory that we had built for schools and it's March, 2020. And I'm like, what are we gonna do? Because we have all this inventory. So like a lot of people, we decided to start an online store mm -hmm. and you're like, shipping frozen had its challenges. Yeah. I mean, if anyone's watched the Dragon's Den episode, you know, they said, you're, you want to ship frozen, that's going to be a disaster. But it was our, at that moment, it was really our only option. Mm -hmm. And we took, a, we took a big risk. And we opened up shipping across Canada. And we were shipping popsicles. And one order led to someone ordering 10 orders for their coworkers. And it just kept growing from there. And that was one of the best decisions we made because it not only allowed us to test the e-commerce, but it allowed us to get a sense of who our customers were, what they wanted, where they were located. And that has been so valuable in us launching into grocery because any province that we launch in, we now have people who had tried our product, who were excited. So word of mouth helped. Word of mouth has been so helpful. Like our customers, I really, I consider them brand evangelists because they'll post about Happy Pops, they'll share it. We're so lucky to have incredible, an incredible community behind the brand. That's amazing. So would you say, like you mentioned, that the, the flavor, the taste was the easy part. So would you say in this journey, the pandemic and everything getting shut down was the most difficult part because everybody's been telling you that you cannot ship frozen products, but you did not listen to them at that point because you did not have any choice. So would you say that that was the most difficult part of your entire journey so far? I guess there's always different, like, hurdles when you're building a business and you, you know you think this is the biggest moment and then you kind of overcome it and you look back and you're like why was I why was this even a question or you know I was debating this and it yeah. it makes you stronger and you you know the I think I think the risks just get bigger as you continue to grow yeah. because when at that moment we didn't have fancy packaging the experience didn't matter as much as it matters but it was different and then you start shipping frozen and we didn't have printed boxes and customers were receiving these packages and white boxes. And then we listened to our customers and we printed the boxes and worked on improving that experience. So I guess at every point there's these hurdles and then you overcome them and then there's a new hurdle and there's a new risk and you have to determine, yeah. is it worth taking this risk? So is that the advice you'd give to somebody who's going through challenges and then listening to people telling that you cannot do that, but you actually have to do that? Yeah, I would say it's tough when it comes to advice. Yeah. Mentors are great, yeah. but you also have to take some, of, some advice, you know, and, and see what makes sense. And I usually say a lot of risks should be calculated risks. What am I gonna lose by doing this? Mm -hmm. And in our case, we didn't have that much to lose by starting an online store, mm -hmm. but then when you start printing packaging, printing inserts, purchasing, you know, insulated boxes in large quantities, the risks yeah. are more significant. Yeah. But you weigh you weigh the pros and cons of doing these things. So I would say I would say, you know, to be an entrepreneur you definitely have to take risks. It's just determining, you know, how much am I willing to lose and can I afford this risk yeah. at this time. Yeah, just a leap of faith sometimes can exactly. take you. Yeah, of course. So looking back at like five, six, seven years now, would you say that it was the right choice of not taking forward your dream of becoming a doctor and doing a master's degree and to now being an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, I am so lucky that I absolutely love what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I say I get up, I'm excited about Mondays. I don't need coffee. Like I genuinely love what, what I'm doing. You know, there's definitely challenging days, but like, 
to be able to see one person eat a happy pop or the messages that come in through our social media or the emails it makes every challenge worth it and i would not i would know i wouldn't know i don't think i would get that same satisfaction you know going back to school or doing anything else and it and while there's still that same passion uh, you know i'm going to keep building happy pops and trying to get it into more house more households across the country because right now it's so fun it's exciting and you know i'm really really lucky the community the support from friends and family and everyone that's helped get us to this point and continues to be in our corner it means a lot so is that something you see in the future for happy pop maybe taking it international as well you know i think the sky's the limit i mean it's just as everybody knows it takes a lot of capital to build a business and we want to we have not raised any capital so we are bootstrapped mm -hmm. so we just need to keep growing strategically at a reasonable pace mm -hmm. but yeah i mean i would love to keep building happy pops and let's see where it goes amazing so what would you say about your life right now with whatever your business is standing at right now how do you say that feels it's a good question i think i think i've always thought you know I initially when I started building Happy Pops, I thought it would be like a quick ex you know, you build something you want to exit because you get you see that around you. Yeah. We see all these people raising capital and then trying to exit. But I've learned that I think certain industries and certain products are different. And I think that's what Happy Pops is. I think it's taken time to establish yourself in the frozen space. It takes time to get listings in grocery. It takes time for people to be willing to try a new product or to see a new product and to give it a shot and for it to get known. So I think right now I'm actually really happy with where we're at as a as a company, you know, I think with being bootstrapped, a pandemic, uh and the challenging nature of a frozen business, yeah. you know, I think I just want to enjoy the process. I think at the moment you know i i think it would be very different if i didn't enjoy it i'm lucky that i'm doing this because i i enjoy it well that's very inspiring for anybody all of our viewers were listening that obviously if you enjoy what you're doing then monday doesn't feel like a monday like you said and our viewers want to find out more about your product or no or maybe just want to reach out to you how can they do that please let them know Yeah, I mean you can find our products uh in about 1500 grocery stores across the country. We just recently launched in Sobeys so across Canada, Sobeys, Safeway, uh and some IGAs. You can also find us in Metro, Longos, Whole Foods, Farm Boy. There's a whole list on our website and if you are in Ontario, you can order from our online store and have it delivered to you. Well, amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today, Leila. Thank you for watching the Edge of Leaders show. Stay tuned for more episodes and if you know someone who's a good fit for our show then please feel free to reach out to us.